answer questions one to six. Good morning. So, what can I do for you? Well, it's about the accommodation where I'm staying at the moment. First, can you give me your name and address, please? Yes, I'm Maria Dominguez, and the address is Twelve Pine Tree Terrace. It's in Westcliff. I'm staying with two other students. There's actually four of us in the house: us three students and the lady who rents the house to us. So, is there a problem? Well, there are a few actually. You know, I'm a first-year student, and though I lived away from home for a while when I was studying over the summer in Mexico City, I've never lived abroad, and it's a big change for me. The course is tough, but that's not the main difficulty. I'm coping with that up till now, anyway. The accommodation was arranged for you by our office, wasn't it? It's a nice place by the sea. Okay, but it's difficult. There are only a few buses, and it takes about fifty minutes. It's just so far away, and there's no way I can get back if I want to stay on after seven. And also, the other thing is, there's nothing to do there. It's basically just a village. All my friends stay on campus. What about the girls you live with? Do you get on with them? Well, when I see them, but one of them is hardly ever there. Mostly, she stays in a house with friends. They've got plenty of extra space, you see. The other girl is quiet as a mouse and hardly ever leaves her room. The landlady's friendly enough, though a bit forgetful, and she doesn't keep the place very clean. I don't have any real problem with her as a person, though. I understand it's rather far away, so I suppose you'd like us to find you a place in the halls of residence or closer by in the town. That would be good. You did say in your brochure that most first-year students are offered a place in halls. I think it actually said final-year students have priority there. They need the library facilities more for studying for their finals. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. Anyway, let's see what we can do. Just a moment. I'll check what might be free. Sometimes students drop out or move from halls, though we were full at the beginning of term. By the way, have you checked the student notice boards? You know, there's one in each of the four colleges, don't you? There are often requests for people to share houses, and it can be quite cheap. No, I hadn't thought of that, but it's a bit of a risk living with complete strangers. Now I see there's a room free in Hillside College. That's the one with the tall tower, right? That's it. It's the smallest college and has a reputation for being quite fun. Oh, but it's a shared room. Would you consider that? That's going to be a problem for studying, isn't it? What if she plays music all the time, and maybe we won't have anything in common? Maria, I see you're studying history. So is this girl, Francesca. She's Italian. Well, at the moment I'm doing the general humanities course, which includes history. But actually, I'm planning to change to literature quite soon. That's not the thing, though. I really want a room on my own. Right. I'm afraid I don't see any other openings. There's nothing showing up on the computer, at least on campus. Well, if I have to stay where I am now, I'm going to find it more and more depressing. Here's one more thing we can try. The university owns several places on the Thanet Road, and also by the West train station. Both of these are about a twenty-minute walk down the hill. 
They're not the newest of buildings, but I could check for you. Can you come back tomorrow? Oh, no, that's Saturday. What about Monday? Yes, sure. I'd really appreciate it if you could do something for me. Let's hope so. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a lecturer discussing the possibility of creating nuclear fusion. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. We look at the sun, a huge ball streaming out essentially limitless energy into space, and we think about how we need that energy here on Earth. Our oil reserves are running out, coal burning causes much pollution, and nuclear energy has many dangers. But where does the sun itself get its energy? The answer is that the sun makes it using fusion, or, more specifically, in a hydrogen fusion process. There is no pollution, no radioactivity, no waste products, and we have plenty of hydrogen. So, hydrogen fusion seems the perfect answer to our energy needs, and scientists have long attempted to achieve it here on Earth. So what happens during this process? The first step is to make two light atomic particles approach. In the case of our sun, these are hydrogen particles, the lightest and also the easiest to deal with. However, the problem is that the nuclei of atoms have electric fields and fusion between these particles is opposed by their similar electric charge. They most naturally repel each other and the nuclei of all elements are exactly the same in this respect. Thus, in order to overcome this repulsion and force them together, in the second step, the particles are heated. The trouble is, you need a lot of heat, incredible temperatures of the sort only seen on the surface of the sun. This is many millions of degrees, far higher than the melting point of any known material. Still, the concept is simple. The hot, wildly moving particles, which are now called plasma, will crash into each other, resulting in the third step, the fusion into helium, which releases energy and begins a self-sustained process. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. So, we know how fusion works. Thus, the big question is, can we create it here on Earth? We actually have the technology to superheat hydrogen into plasma, but no container on Earth can deal with those temperatures. Thus, we need to confine this superheated material so that it doesn't touch anything. For that, we need a special reactor, and most research has focused on an apparatus known as a tokamak system. That's T-O-K-A-M-A-K, 
an acronym from some Russian words meaning toroidal chamber with magnetic field. It's an apt name since a very powerful magnetic field is used to confine and suspend the super hot plasma in the air so that it doesn't touch anything. This is possible only because this plasma has an electric charge which interacts with the magnetic field. Of course, the walls of the fusion vessel will still get hot, very hot, and to avoid being melted, they must be cooled with a cryogenic system to intensely low temperatures. But now we are faced with the second problem. If we are to draw power from this system, the reaction must be continuous and controllable. However, when fusion begins, the plasma becomes unstable, and at these temperatures, that is a very serious situation. If we lose control, a disaster could result. Despite the obstacles, in 2010, a European device managed some success, but needed far more power to generate the fusion reaction than that produced from the fusion itself. Obviously then, it was not useful as a power source. More to the point, this system could only sustain a fusion reaction for a fraction of a second, yet to self-sustain, the fusion needs to run for at least 10 seconds. And the future looks bleak. Unfortunately, most scientists predict that many decades will have to pass before fusion power can become a practical reality. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student, Penny, talking to two friends, Ray and Louise, about a television competition Ray has entered called Travel Documentary. Before you hear the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi, haven't seen you two in ages. What have you been up to? Hi, Penny. Ray is really excited. He's just been shortlisted for travel documentary. He could be off travelling around the world for three months. Travel documentary? What's that? You've never heard of it? Don't you watch TV? Well, actually, no, hardly ever, especially since I've started working on my thesis. I don't have time to breathe, let alone watch TV. So what's this all about, Ray? Well, actually, it, it's a competition run by public TV. It involves my two great loves, travel and filmmaking. Is it that program where people are sent around the world making documentary videos? I have heard of it. Fantastic! So you've been chosen? Not yet. I'm one of 34 selected for an interview next week, so I've made it through the first cut. Yeah, there were over 200 applicants from around the country. Pretty amazing, hey? Well, I've been lucky so far. What's the next stage? 13 are chosen from the interview to do a four-week training course in documentary filmmaking. Then, the eight finalists get sent off with a video camera to travel around the world. Sounds incredible. What's the catch? The catch is that every two weeks, you have to send in a 10-minute video from a different part of the world. It's broadcast on TV along with the work of three of the other competitors, 
and judged by a panel of experts and the TV audience. So you're under a lot of pressure. Wow, I guess so. You mean you're on television every two weeks? Yep, that's right. But first I have to be selected. Do you have to have any filmmaking experience to apply? Some background in photography or video making helps, but you're not supposed to be an expert. In fact, you can't apply if you've already worked in filmmaking. We all get the same four-week course, so we start with the same skills. Can you go anywhere in the world you want? Each competitor makes up his or her own travel plans and has to get them approved. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions 27 to 30. Have you talked with anyone else who has done it? As a matter of fact, just last week, I met Sarah Price, a girl from here who did it last year. What did she have to say about it? She said it was the most amazing experience of her life, but it was really tough at times. I think you'd have to be really brave to take off like that alone with so much responsibility. It's not like going on a holiday, is it? <laughs> no. Two weeks in a country often where you can't speak the language to find a story, film it, organise all the editing. Then you're off to a completely different part of the world to start all over again. Pretty exhausting, but exciting too. What a way to see the world. What about Sarah Price? Did she have any bad experiences? She said the worst part was when she got some mysterious fever in Mongolia and thought she might have to be sent home. Fortunately, it got better, but she said it was scary to feel really ill when you're alone so far away. So what made you want to apply? When I saw the program on TV a while ago, I thought... This is for me. I've always wanted to travel, but needed to work for a year before I could even think about it. Then a new series started up. I thought, now's my chance. Don't you think you'll be lonely? I don't think I'll have time to be homesick. I'm more worried about having too much to do and not enough time to get things organised. So we might be watching you on television in the next few months? I hope so, if I'm lucky. When will you know for sure? They choose the final eight in March. A month later, you're on your way. So do you have to pay anything? Nothing. It's all paid for. Course, camera, flights, accommodation and in-country travel. The budget is pretty tight, though. No extras. I sure hope you get it. Then I'll be finding time to watch at least one program on television every week. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture on cities of the future. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 37.
Okay, we've been looking at how societies will develop in the future and at the increase in the size of cities. So I want to talk to you today about the key considerations in these cities of the future. There are three key elements I want to look at, and these are the new features they will have, issues of size, and the main problems to be considered. First of all, individual transportation will be a big factor in these new megacities as public transport becomes unmanageable. There'll be a huge rise in the use of segways, which are personal transporters, like motorized scooters. As a result, and partly also to reduce pollution, roads will be altered so that they are narrower and will take up less of a city's space than they do currently. Naturally, this is a major change to the infrastructure, and something that may hinder it is the huge amount of investment it will require. The next thing is, what is going to happen to the commercial areas? We do not want these to become even larger concrete jungles than they are at present, so we have to look at design. And current designs for city development include building gardens on the roofs of these buildings to make a more pleasant environment for workers. And you may think that these areas will expand to cope with increased commercial activity. In fact, the prediction is that they will cover one-fifth of the area that they do at present as we build upwards. The exception to this is shopping centres, which we predict will expand with more and more temperature-controlled malls. What may cause difficulties is that the superstores will be confined to the outer edges of the city, as they will be too big to fit into the new malls. Then, of course, there are the residential areas, and these will undergo their own changes. One particular development will be houses which are built from glass, as innovations in this material allow it to provide light without causing problems with temperature inside a building. The residential areas will not be allowed to expand without limit, as happens in some areas at present, and their size will be restricted to a population of 15,000. One issue, which has yet to be resolved, and I'm not sure it ever will be, is how we manage to house older residents. They will be increasing in numbers as time goes on. Finally, how will these cities live? We know we have limited energy sources, so what will we do? Well, something currently in development, which will be a feature, is that waste is going to become an energy source. For example, to provide gas in homes. Also, as new technology and systems are developed, we will find that energy plants will become smaller. Another energy source we could use, but one which raises issues of having enough space and too much noise, is wind farms. Because of the problems, I'm not convinced these will be the grand solution to our energy problems that we thought they were going to be. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 38 to 40. Now, moving on to looking at the social aspect of cities, we need to look at housing and how people will live. Cities currently have flats in the centre, populated by single people and wealthier residents, and families tend to move to the outskirts. In the future, the centre of cities will see a dramatic change. We will see many more examples of cooperative buildings. This is where people join together to form a company that owns the building they live in. And despite continuing shortages, there will also be a rise in the provision of retirement homes in city centres so that the elderly can have easy access to hospitals and shops. Recently, we have seen a levelling off in the growth of private housing, and I think that will not change. 
But we are likely to see more social housing, as far fewer people will be able to afford to own their own homes. OK, now, if anybody has... Any that is the end of part four. Check your answers.